Rays. Hello, Liz. <laughs> I guess what we should say is hello, listeners, hello, because that's listeners. who we're addressing. Um, so we had here at Drew and On some other episodes in the can that we had scheduled to come out, but um, after the events in the Middle East, it didn't seem like totally the right time for that, so we're actually going to hold off on those. And in the meantime, we thought we could unlock this episode we did with Noah Colwyn from Blowback podcast um, a while back. There is... A lot of disinformation and noise and fog of war. People love using that phrase. Um, There's also a lot of meta discussion about the right or the wrong way to talk about the situation in Gaza. We're going to link to some of our episodes that we've done in the past in the description here about the, I guess I would say the hurdles to having honest conversations about the blockade of Gaza and the history of the occupation in the West Bank. That includes some of our conversations with Norman Finkelstein um, and also our recent discussion, also with Noah, about the instability of the Netanyahu government and um, his shaky right-wing coalition. I want to say something, too, real quick, if you don't mind, um, which is that I sympathize with a lot of people, and this is mostly Americans I'm speaking to, who don't exactly know kind of what to do, but feel an impulse to do something, kind of anything. I think like social media has provided a sort of salve for that in a lot of ways, which funny enough, we actually talked about, we talked about that a little bit with Vincent Bevins in our last episode about his new book. Um, But for what's happening in Gaza now and throughout Palestine and Israel and now maybe Lebanon and Egypt, I mean, stuff is like unfolding very quickly Um, But it feels like it's only going to get worse from here. And I think the media in particular has provided plenty of cover for corrupt actors to make sure that that happens. And if you say what is happening is a genocide, and if you say what is happening is a cleansing, if you say what's happening is a war crime over and over again, you are called hysterical, you are called unreasonable, You are dismissed as woke or infantile or someone with luxury beliefs with no skin in the game or bourgeois hypocrite. Like, I've heard it since I was a teen when we invaded Iraq. And then, you know, basically in every conflict since, you know, any opposition to any, you know, U.S. involved or U.S. backed conflict since. And for all of the talk over the years about the so-called dominance of the activist left or whatever, like all the think pieces, I think a lot of our listeners have probably read You know, I think we're seeing in real time just how marginal a lot of that is, the so-called institutional or cultural power that, you know, that the so-called left has at these liberal organizations or apparently in the media, um, et cetera, or, you know, just like how flimsy that alleged grasp is when rubber meets the road. And I don't know what you're supposed to call the systematic starving of civilians, of 2 million people, about 40% of our children. Like, I don't know what you're supposed to call the bureaucratic management of deprivation where 90% of Gaza's water supply, which has now apparently been shut off, is unfit, just completely unfit for human consumption and designed to be so, to make life so unbelievably miserable that there's one hospital that receives 30 suicide attempts a month of kids just trying to hang themselves or poisoning themselves with pesticides. Like, is it hysterical to talk about that? Like, I don't know. How hysterical is it, is it like, okay to act in a situation like this, right? And part of me thinks that we can't even fully describe what life in Gaza is like because Americans are just not prepared to confront the full horror of the situation and our support for the creation and management of that hell. So, I mean, yeah, at a certain point, you know, all of these discursive games, they don't matter. Um, Except for us in America, you know, they do. Because, and I'm just going to speak for myself here, you know, it is very difficult to stomach the phrase unprovoked when you understand the situation in Gaza. And the thing is, the biggest hurdle to anything happening right now is piercing through the veil of some of that propaganda that is out there and basically insisting on it. So this episode is about a film that a lot of people haven't seen, but some people have, called The Lobby. And it's a product of an Al Jazeera investigation, all of which that has been basically digitally buried. Um, The situation in the Middle East and, you know, our involvement in it, the U.S. involvement in it is unfolding very quickly and changing. 
And I think that we're going to have um, some more stuff coming up for you on that. But in the meantime, you can check out all the other episodes we've done. We're going to link to it here. Um, and yeah. Yeah, I'd like to co-sign uh, what, what Liz just said right there. I am fucking exhausted. So me trying to get my, my, my thoughts and my words together is not going very well right now. My advice, as always, is don't go fucking insane when an insane thing happens, um, which I think is uh, a lot of people not heeding that advice right now. Uh, but just, you know, it, I'll tell you this. You're never going to pack, you know, all those fucking Instagram intro graphics and all that shit you read. Don't let it drive you fucking nuts. Um, we are working on some stuff right now that will hopefully um, – be able to shed a light on a, uh, a a different side of the situation than the one that you're seeing in a lot of the media right now and kind of being bombarded with. Uh, and yeah, we're, we're, we're working on that. So uh, without further ado, here is the episode. <laughs> okay, I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. So Where'd today, today, well, I went to go watch Eight Mile. If you'd fucking let me finish today, 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 we are recording an extra special episode. It is our breakdown of the film Eight Mile. Right? That's a, is that what we're supposed to watch, <laughs> Liz? You told uh, me to watch no. a movie, and I had two things written down. I had Eight Mile and some Israel bullshit. I can't remember which I was supposed to watch. <laughs> So I just watched Eight Miles. That cool. What did was you think of Eight Mile? What did you think of? I it? didn't finish it, but it seemed pretty good. It, 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 it's that guy looks exactly like Eminem. It's fucking crazy. It's very, it's gritty, isn't it? I, I do not believe that gritty was in it, but yeah, I, I, it was, it was, it was pretty good. I watched the first 15, 20 minutes. It's crazy because Eminem, like the CGI that they did to make that guy look like Eminem, straight up could have been out of Star Wars. Oh, it was fantastic. Stop it! It was Eminem. I don't know what game you're getting at. I never know what the bits they're doing are. Is there? There's an eight mile game. Hello. Uh, I'm excited, baby. I'm excited. I know you love I'm ready to rock. we're talking about uh, Israel. Mm-hmm. I'm schnozzed up, baby. I'm ready. I'm ready to rock. It's good because I get to talk about my people. Whenever we talk about when we do our when we do our eight episode Polish series, we get to talk about your people. <laughs> History of the city of Danzig. No one is gonna want to listen to that. Or as I call it, Gdansk. That was pretty cool. They renamed Aww. it that. No one would want to uh-huh. listen to a Polish series. Well, that's true. I fuck. I'm th- trying to think of a Polish joke right now, but what I should no. say is Polish series. Well, yeah, they tried to record it, but unfortunately, uh, they recorded into an actual Apple instead of the Apple Podcast app. That's that is stupid. Mm-hmm. Anyway, uh, I'm Liz. Hello, my name is Brace. Hi, we are joined, of course, as always, by producer Young Chomsky. And we've got an Israel episode today. Yeah, yeah, we're back. We're back with our old friend, Noah Colwyn, who's mm-hmm. joining us to talk about a um, an interesting case. Interesting yes. case of a documentary never seen. Mm-hmm. The, the documentary is called The Lobby. It was originally supposed to be put out by Al Jazeera, uh, which means the Jazeera in, in Arabic. Um <laughs> And uh, it's it looks to, it, it's a it's a fantastic documentary. We got the link down below. Um, but this is basically the story of that documentary and the story of why you have not seen that documentary. So without further ado, let's uh, let's hop on the airplane and go on our birthright trip, baby. Zoom zoom. Ah! <laughs> 
Oh, sorry. Oh, bad jewel pod. Oh, Lord. So I know we have company too. This is humiliating. Uh, welcome. Uh, Liz, you do it. We got, who do we got? Oh my God. Brace. We're really going with that? We're going with it, baby. (laughs) Oh my God. All right. All right. Fine. Uh, welcome to True Non. Uh, we are joined today, special guest, returning special guest, it's our second mm-hmm. time on the podcast, Noah Colwyn, contributing editor at Jewish Currents and the uh, co-host, co-producer of Blowback Pod, a series about the Iraq War, which is uh, excellent. Uh, Noah, how's and- it going? Going good, going good. Thanks for having me. Absolute- Thanks for coming I mean- back. We didn't scare you away the first time. <laughs> No, no, no. I'm I'm always excited to come back and talk Jews. Also, I'm so sorry for leaking your address and parents' first and last names to the Canary Mission. That was my bad. I thought I was signing you up for a cool mailing list. I did not know I was doing that, and I have returned the money they gave me. Well, you know, I, I guess all I can say is that um, it was really shitty of you to have done that, and I don't Well, it, the the way to get out of all trouble, listeners... Follow me. Follow me with this. I'm telling you the truth. The way to get out of trouble with anything is just be like, "Oh damn, my bad," and everyone's <laughs> like, "I get it. I fucked up before too." So we have Noah here today to talk about. Okay, I was about to say something really fucked up there. I was about to say, oh my god, how many times in this episode are you gonna say that before you say something? I, this was an accident. I was about to say. To talk about the greatest story never told. <laughs> that is a that is a neo-Nazi documentary, which is not what we're talking about tonight. We are talking about uh, we're we're talking about a a a, a four part documentary. I don't know if I want to call it a film because it's not like it was released in theaters, but a four part documentary series that never came out, right? Yeah, it's a like hidden journalistic gem that you can watch on YouTube, but that was never actually aired. Yeah. yeah, this is um, actually one of the, I think we could call it one of the biggest, uh, I don't know, I'd say journalistic exposés uh, in the last couple of years that literally no one knows about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's astounding because like if you watch it um, on YouTube, well, what, what is you can it? do. What is it? I, I was going to reveal that at the end so as oh, not to uh, talk that. No, I'm kidding. The, it's, it's, called, <laughs> it's called The Lobby. Uh, specifically the Lobby USA. There's sort of two series here. There's the Lobby UK, and then there's the Lobby USA. The Lobby UK came out. I think you could still watch that on Al Jazeera's YouTube channel, right? Correct. Uh, but the Lobby USA did not come out. And uh, it is released. Somebody leaked it to uh, Electronic Intifada, and it is it is available to watch in full, all four episodes on their YouTube channel. It's a little hard to find, so you just got to look up. I, the best way to look it up is to look up the Lobby USA episode one or two, three, four. Or you could uh, just uh, click the links that we're going to include in the show notes to the episodes. Yeah, but this is, I'm saying this, what if we forget? <laughs> we're not going to forget. <laughs> Anyways, this documentary never came out. And and it's a pretty, um, it's funny because the, the documentary's subject is basically also the reason it didn't come out. Yes, it's like this kind of like weird Charlie Kaufman esque kind of thing where mm-hmm. this is like a story about the influence of a foreign government, the covert influence of a foreign government on American soil, the surveillance that they conduct on American citizens, and how it's done to suppress any activism or discussion about the activities of that foreign government. Um, and then there's, you know, like the, I guess what happened after the movie uh, didn't come out. That sort of sheds more light on that. Yeah, it's like basically a perfect example of everything that the documentary was kind of bringing to light. It's a very bizarre, yeah, Kaufman esque is a good is a good word for it. <laughs> so I I said before that that it's the second part of a sort of two part series. I, that sounds confusing because there's parts. The episodes are called part one, two, and three, and four. There are two different series here. There's a Lobby USA and then there's the Lobby UK, but they're connected because they both basically involve one guy going essentially undercover as a spy for about, I think, 10 months to a year uh, as sort of an up-and-coming, you know, fresh-faced, very 
clean, cleanly dressed young Zionist. Right. Yeah, he, I don't think that we revealed. We're talking about the state of Israel. <laughs> We just were saying a foreign government, but we're talking about the, the uh, you know, the a lobby for the Israeli government, correct? Yes. And this fresh-faced young activist is a, uh, like, he, he sort of positioned himself as kind of a, you know, like, interested, young, kind of energetic climber. And he was able to score in Washington an internship at a very well-connected and a very quietly influential lobbying shop called the Israel Project. Mm. Yeah, and and through that meets a host of, um, well, I, I think it's fair to say scumbags uh, who who are engaged in a variety of nefarious activities, both sort of on campuses and in Congress and basically anywhere else where you can lobby people and get mad at people. And yeah, yeah. I think. One of the biggest, and we'll get into like more details and even just like the kind of, you know, more top line revelations, but it's pretty stunning just how active everyone is on college campuses and like how focused, um, you know, their lobby efforts are, you know, I, I think it's well known kind of, you know, what. Uh, the relationships in Washington, in D.C., and in, you know, lobbying Congress and donors. And it's less um, maybe clear how organized the efforts are on college campuses. Right. I think one of the things that this movie makes clear and makes explicit in a lot of ways is that, you know, there's this idea that we have of how lobbying works, which is that, mm -hmm. like, you know, a guy in a shitty, fitting, expensive suit goes and opens a briefcase of money. Um, and, you know, like that is like like and, and, and it goes to political campaigns. It goes to PACs. It goes to organizations that uh, employ uh, or are, you know, in the network of the politicians they want to support and so on. And what this documentary shows is sort of a layer below that and um, and sort of. Uh, other networks outside of like DC specifically where they're able to kind of cultivate that sort of influence that they want. Um, and the college campus is in this documentary, a lot of where that energy ends up getting spent. Um, and it's actually quite, you know, sort of, I think one of the real strengths of the documentary is that it gets the people who are organizing all of this to speak incredibly clearly, like yes. completely mm -hmm. candidly with no shame, about what it is exactly that they're doing. Yeah. Oh, it's 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 incredible sort of the amount of cynicism captured on film here. I mean, people people saying just things that I would not admit to people that I was friends with that I'm sure weren't spies, let alone a stranger or someone I had barely met. Um one thing though is that like yeah, it does show a lot of of just how focused the Israel lobby and sort of this whole apparatus is on college campuses. And why is that, Noah? I mean, I, I didn't go to college, so I don't know. <laughs> Maybe people are going crazy about Palestine there, but but what's going on? Uh, so it's funny because this is actually, this question's connected a bit to the last time that I was on the show, which is that it's mm -hmm. about the politics of continuity, which is that, you know, for Jewish donors and for, you know, older Jewish donors, um, and, you know, large swaths of the major American Jewish establishment, ensuring that there is another generation of American Jews that resembles the previous generations of American Jews is their priority. And so the college campus is sort of viewed as like a, you know, and it's like a fairly American tradition, is viewed as the place where they intervene to make sure that that happens. It's one place that they intervene. And on the other side of it, it's, you know, more broadly in kind of conjuring support and creating support for the pro-Israel movement, um, as they think of themselves, and creating, you know, support for the policies of the Israeli government and their and its occupation. Uh, it's really effective, you know, to go to the college campus where all this activism is happening and to, you know, try and, I mean, in their view, what they see themselves as doing as trying to stop, like, this incipient movement. And... Mm -hmm. I think like the parallel that they discuss in the documentary because they're terrified of how dangerous it is if this were ever to become sort of the widely uh, accepted view of the situation is that it's the equivalent of you know South the South African government trying mm. to stop 
college American college activists from fighting against apartheid. What they are trying to do is that they are trying to stop the uh, pro-Palestinian activists from succeeding in painting the Israeli government as fundamentally what it is, which is an apartheid state. Yeah, that's something I, I found really interesting because because that parallel is drawn in this. Like, mm. okay, the 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 sort of BDS movement or the uh, you know the anti-apartheid movement uh, for South Africa gained a lot of steam, and and it it they, you know it shows pretty explicitly here how how the pro-Israel lobby has recognized that the potential for the similar thing happening happening with Israel and especially similar sentiments growing maybe even among younger Jews. In America, um, how how that could you know right now it's a pretty small movement. I mean, relative to I mean, even the size of the anti-apartheid movement, but it has the possibility of blowing up into a much larger thing, and they want to nip that right in the bud. Yeah, they 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 um, also make a note about the changing nature of the parties, which I found interesting. Where they said that they felt the Democrats were moving um, to be less friendly toward Israel, where the Republicans have really consolidated that, um, that base. Uh, I think, you know, I'm sure that we would have a different, um, you know, view of that, but it is like, I mean, it does, it, it's quite clear. I mean, from their own, I mean, you know, to be clear, like there, this is all on tape recording video that this undercover journalist captures these very, very candid conversations like they really do view BDS as a growing movement that threatens support for Israel. And it's also the way that they talk about BDS and the way that they frame mm -hmm. it in the documentary is as, you know, that they are fighting a terrorist network. Like the strategy. Yeah. So yeah. like let's let's just like set aside for a moment questions about like the tactical successes or shortcomings of the BDS movement. To the from the perspective of the Israeli government. The BDS movement is the single greatest f threat that they face uh, that's not in the form of, like, a rival government. Yeah. Um, Wait, really it's... quickly, just in case there are people listening, can you explain exactly what the BDS movement is? Right. So BDS stands for Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions. And the goal is to, um, you know, it's it's sort of emerged, the to give a, a little bit of a history that goes just a little bit further back, Um in the second intifada in uh, the early 2000s, after the collapse of Camp David and, the, and just like the, the the revelation that the Oslo Accords, the peace negotiations were just going nowhere and kind of a farce, um, there was a sort of like, you know, like there was a, a violent uprising that mm -hmm. the Palestinians undertook called the Second Intifada. And then when that failed, there was a reassessment of strategy and a number of Palestinian activists chose to launch the BDS movement. The idea being that they would try and urge boycotts of Israeli goods, that they wanted uh, companies and governments to divest from Israeli businesses and, uh, and, and from the Israeli economy, and to then ultimately impose, and this is the important part, impose sanctions on the Israeli government. Um, and the BDS movement, from the perspective like, as Israel sees it, is that like you know they they're afraid of the, they're very and they actively talk about in this documentary they're afraid of the South Africa compar comparison to the mm -hmm, extent yeah. that they will go to South Africa find black South Africans put them on a plane to Israel write a blog post about it just so that they can have the headline and they can have the kind of person they can instrumentalize to say hey we found a black South African and, yeah I and, thought that right. was really extraordinary how how I mean. To, to listeners at home, there is a scene in this documentary where they describe basically step by step doing exactly that. And it is a stage full of white Israelis and American Jews basically talking about this just incredibly cynical move of, of finding whichever, uh, you know, anti-apartheid or even maybe just black South African that they can find flying them out there. And I mean, the implication for me is that they probably write, I mean... It, it's sort of spelled out, not incredibly blatantly elsewhere in the documentary, but the implication is that that these foundations actually might have written these articles in the first place. Again, I don't know if that's actually true, uh, and then basically slapped whoever's face on it. Um, I mean, it's just incredibly cynical. And it's done because the Israeli government, which is ultimately the strategic interest that these groups represent, um, the Israeli government looks at BDS and they see, like, you know, <laughs> 
like something that could, you know, be just as destructive from the perspective of Benjamin Netanyahu as like Iran having a nuclear bomb. Yeah. And it's like in his interest and what has been the policy of his government to finance and aggressively go to battle with in the sort of court of public opinion with things like the BDS movement to sort of make the case for Israel. What's called like in, in Hebrew, Hasbara, like the process of, you know, sort of uh, executing propaganda such yeah. that they created a whole new ministry called the Ministry of Strategic Affairs, which plays quite prominently in this documentary that executes and is sort of the nerve center for fighting back against BDS, uh, like within the Israeli government. From kind of from what I got in this documentary, and again, I, there's, there's, this isn't spelled out explicitly, although one can kind of put the pieces together, is that the Israeli uh, Ministry for Strategic Affairs kind of is, is the director behind a lot of, at very least, the thrust of these, you know, myriad uh pro-israel american groups i i will say that this is probably a good moment to talk about the whole anti-semitism thing yes um i think that like this is a like a lot of people uh get very very mixed up when they start talking about this kind of stuff um not because it's like you know like the facts aren't horrible or because like they have questions about it but because like when you start talking with you know there's like a sort of like fear and and about like or, or, or you know like hesitation about talking about like a jewish government that is mm. actively coordinating or pulling the strings in some kind of conspiracy and i, I think mm. like a way to talk about that is that like well i think that you know there are other governments around the world and all sorts of like actors that do this exact same stuff it's not mm -hmm. israel that said, the United States has a very specific relationship with Israel, and Israel commits some very specific, like, you know, like horrendous crimes, and has this kind of, has, has its government uses this kind of um, sort of conspiratorial activity to advance its own agenda. And I think that that's, like, absolutely fair game, and I feel like I did just want to, like, sort of uh, affirm that for, for people yeah, listening. Yeah, I, I, think, I think people, I mean, whenever you talk about this stuff, people do get very nervous, but you can see that, like, Many other countries, specifically the country that we are in right now, America, does this same exact thing, where, where, where they essentially have a million think tanks and organizations and media outlets or whatever that are essentially controlled basically by either a government agency or take the line of a specific government agency, often the State Department, uh, to advance that line. And, and so what's happening here is like, yeah, you are essentially seeing a lobby that is acting the behest of, of a country's strategic interest. This is not unique to Israel. However, this documentary is uniquely about Israel. And so we are talking about it in that regard. But yeah, I, I, I do think it's like, it's, it's certainly tricky to talk about. Yeah. I mean, sure. I'll give, to give one example that's from the documentary is that woman, Julia Reifkind, who worked at the yeah, Israeli yeah. embassy in D.C., and she, her job was to basically like, you know, she originally, she went to UC Davis and while actually there's this one part from the documentary, I'm just going to say, roll the clip. It's this part where when she's asked, um, like, uh, like, you know, why did UC Davis become such an anti-Israel compass? And she says, uh, well, you know, there are a lot of Muslims in Sacramento. I came to UC Davis, which had a reputation of being really pro-Israel. Now it's like the top five most anti-Israel schools in the U.S. Why not? Because of everything that happened in the last few years. It was just particularly bad. Um, and there's a huge Muslim population in Sacramento, which is right next to Davis. Yeah. Um, which is just like crazy, like, like just crazy racist. Um, well, and she, you know, and she says, I mean, maybe this is what you're getting at, but she says explicitly, she's like, oh, that's not really my boss, but they're really my boss. Yes, you exactly. Know? She, she plays you know, very coy about, about it. Speaking about who? Uh, about the Ministry of Strategic Affairs. So it's, ah. it's very clear, like, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, they're not my boss, but this is my, you know, they're my boss. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I thought that whole segment with, with her at UC Davis was fascinating because the documentary does a really good job of – they have actual footage of, of one of the events that they're talking about. And they interview both activists who were pro-BDS activists at UC Davis and they interview uh, this, this, this Julia woman who, by the way, is you know fairly attractive. I will – if she does listen to this – I'll go out with her. Absolutely. Oh my god. Um, god damn. If uh, my bad guys, I'm just calling it. You know, this this is an honest podcast. But um, 
they they have it from really both the both the activist perspective and also sort of a hidden camera pers- uh, interview with this with Julia and to see like you know they obviously have told these activists about about you know the contents of the interview with Julia and they're just astounded because it's so cynical. I mean they the 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 pro Israel activists stage a walkout at one point. And then immediately go to the media and try to frame it as they were essentially kicked out of this meeting while people were chanting, I think, uh, Allahu Akbar. Oh, absolutely. Uh, like there was like a whole like Lo- Megan Kelly, Laura Ingram, mm-hmm. uh, like, the, I mean, and this goes to show that like what, you know, like the real strength of this, uh, one real strength of this and a common thread that the documentary spends a lot of time on is how this like one real facet of the lobby is really just about the media. Like it's really yeah. not even about like trying to massage like or do the work of like, you know, like trying to persuade politicians of anything. It's all just about like, you know, like feeding, I mean, what has what I mean, at least in this stage, is just like the right wing media machine, like Fox News mm-hmm. and so on. Yeah, but also the cable networks as well. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, they straight up say like, you know, no, we're doing astroturfing. I mean, they just they just call saying, it that. <laughs> They're just like, oh, and then and then he's like, I mean, I loved that when um, the undercover journalist was like, wait, what is that? What is astroturfing? And they're just like, oh, it's fake protests. Yeah, I mean, at one point he goes on a bus to a fake protest, but that, that it's like uh, in the last episode. I mean, one yeah, yeah, one of yeah. the things that's also that this documentary sort of illustrates is that like that there is sort of this like very broad constellation of pro-Israel groups, with all of mm-hmm. these like different names and figures that sort of like you know like sprawl like they sprawl out pretty far. And you know, one of the things that I thought was kind of wild was about how. When you take like like the like the the other ways instead of just like organizing like you know those walkouts or whatever, but they were also like conducting active surveillance operations on yes. student activists on social media and through like some frankly more insanely creepy and mortifying methods, which are still active and being used to this day. Yeah, at, yeah. at one point, at one point, one of the um, I, I can't remember what organization it was, but someone who's with one of these organizations that's in the documentary essentially says that they have software that can, as, that trawls through college students' social media posts and can find any pro-Palestine, anti-Israel post within hours of it being being sent up. And what they do is they collect all of these posts and essentially create dossiers. And, and at one point, they're also very explicit, like, these dossiers will be used to bar these people from future employment. Like, we yeah, are collecting dirt. And it's not even limited to, like, sentiment about Palestine or Israel. Like, they'll use, like, photos of people doing sexually explicit things. Or they'll, they'll you know, insinuate rumors and start rumors about activists that to damage their reputation. I mean, it's, like, really scummy shit. And these are, like, this is all, by the way, directed at college kids. I mean, one story yeah. that doesn't, like, so there's a character in the documentary who's brought up whose name is Adam Milstein. Yes. And he's, like, a really great example of a kind of person in this world. So Milstein is a real estate mogul. In the documentary, somebody, uh, the, uh, Tony, the undercover reporter, asks somebody, like, oh, who's Adam Milstein? And the guy responds, like, he pauses for a beat, and then he says, uh, he's a convicted felon. Wait, that's yes. not the best way to introduce him. <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic. <laughs> Um, and he like, and, and Milstein is, you know, he's fairly wealthy on his own, but he's not like Sheldon Adelson money, but Milstein was found later on, um, by student journalists at the university of California at at UC Berkeley, go bears. Um, they like, like they, they found that Milstein was routing money to student Senate campaigns at UCLA for the purpose of making sure that can- like student candidates perceived as anti-Israel wouldn't get in. And Milstein is also known as one of the funders of Canary Mission. And he's also on the National Council of APAC, which is the most influential and, you know, sort of most sanitized Israel lobby that's out there. So wait, you mentioned Canary Mission here. Give me a couple. Fuck! I'm so glad to be able to say this. Give me a couple squawks about the Canary Mission. What are we? What are we squawking about here? Beak up. Did you just say beak up? I said beak up. Yeah, I couldn't hear you. Beak up. All right, just chirp down a minute. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, so Canary Mission is like this thing that we're describing. It's like a giant database online. You can Google it. 
um, and look it up and find it very easily. And the point of it is that, I mean, as you'll see, it's a giant roster assembled by the world's like biggest fucking creeps of just describing what a bunch of college kids did going to like, you know, oh, this person was a member of SJP. This person is an associate of these other 10 people or whatever. Like true, like McCarthyite Red Scare bullshit. And it's meant at like the, they say in this movie that it's explicitly directed at trying to bar student activists from any future employment to make sure that if they, you know, stood for justice in Palestine, that it's something that could be used against them in for the rest of their lives. Like that's the point of it. It's to be weaponized. Yeah. What, one thing that's really astounding on their website that I'm looking at right now is a section called X Canary. And uh, just to read a little bit, X Canary features individuals who are formally investigated and featured on Canary Mission, but have since rejected the latent anti-Semitism on the far right, far left, and among anti-Israel organizations and activists. Uh, it says, due to fear of harassment, X Canary's identities have been removed. And it is essentially a, a roster with no faces. It's like a blank profile picture uh, of people apologizing for being in, in in SJP um it's it's incredible and it's it's what this is is essentially blackmail because if you are someone who does not have much of an online presence and uh someone googles you a prospective employer they're going to see that your name is up on the website of a a, a group that's calling you anti-semitic and to be clear like the the language that that the carrier mission is not that uses is not like equivocal equivocal that's a word yeah it doesn't mm -hmm. like it doesn't have like an interest of fairness in mind the way that like that we see and throughout this documentary that we see is like people are painted in the absolute worst light that they could be possibly painted in to to the extent that they're often lied about or like you know uh, joke social media posts about being a muslim are sort of taken out of context and they're painted as jihadists. I mean, that's something that 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 well, that's, is straight through this documentary. And I think that's also something that, like you, you know, like that you just sort of touched on, which is that all of these people, almost all, like the the vast majority of these people, are Muslim and Arab students. Absolutely, and yeah. It's like like a sort of repeated theme that comes up in this documentary is that the message that is sort of sent from on high that is given to activists is to say, you know, explicitly like students for justice in Palestine is a hate group. These Muslims all hate Jews. They can't be mm -hmm. trusted. Like they're like dangerous radicals. And it's a fundamentally Islamophobic message that they're getting, you know, as the documentary sort of sketches that like it emanates from like, the Israeli government and from influential donors in the American Jewish establishment. I mean, it even shows, I think in the, the second episode uh, about how basically this huge uh, controversy was ginned up about the uh, university of Tennessee um, about how it's like this hotbed. I believe the actual words in an article were described as a hotbed of anti-Semitism because somebody at one of these organizations basically found people's social media posts, some of them from when they were kids that were either anti-Semitic or could like possibly be interpreted as that, or even just anti-Israel, uh, and sent them to media outlets to essentially paint this like, from what I gather, very quiet college campus as uh, you know some jihadist central. Well, it's and incredible. this is. And this is like a recurring theme is that like, you know, the University of California system it did like a whole anti-Semitism report and investigation when I was an undergrad there. And like the gist of it is that there are all these things that, you know, like enormous effort is expended in trying to find out just how much anti-Semitism there is on campus. And these people in the documentary just kind of flat out say, eh, it's not really a big deal. We know it's not, but it's really effective as a smear. But their big anxiety as they end up talking about is that it's losing its, effective as a, it's losing its effectiveness as a smear because more and more people are seeing through it. Correct me if I'm wrong, because my understanding too was that the reason they targeted a place like the University of Tennessee was that Knoxville is like incredibly conservative. And so if you start a kind of, um, you know, a big controversy about anti-Semitism, it's easy to then get law new laws passed that would be, uh, you know, favorable to the Israeli government. Especially in like conservative states and conservative conservative cities that are already kind of, you know, tied up with a lot of those organizations. 
Liz, to your point about like the Tennessee stuff, it's not just that it's like performing for like the evangelicals on the right and who are like, you know, sort of the, the crowd at ten- and, and around Knoxville. Um, I think it's also, you know, a, a sort of thing that emerges from that uh, episode in particular was that the uh, like the the activist most aggressive at going after, you know, perceived anti-Semitism at the University of Tennessee was this guy, Kenneth Marcus. And he was using, he was instrumentalizing that fight in Tennessee, you know, to shore up evangelical support and the natural constituencies around Tennessee, around the area there, and to draw in those activists, but also because it was a way for him to try and manufacture the evidence necessary to push his ultimate goal, which was to get more and more uh, states and authorities to adopt definitions of anti-Semitism that basically exclude any, like, that, like strip away any protections for, um, like, activism critical of uh, Israeli government policy. And it's funny because we see that mirrored uh, by what was happening in Britain, like like that whole controversy in the Labour Party among about adopting the specific um, anti-Semitism code or whatever. And, and it, you know, it, it's not lost on me that the first half of this documentary did take place in, in the UK. And that's also, again, like I said, available on YouTube. And it shows that like many of these groups, like Labour Friends of Israel, I think there's another... Uh, I think it's there's another front group that I believe is involved in, in labor in some way are, are uh, essentially like it, 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 they they mirror the the front groups in in the U S where 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 they basically follow the line of a specific ministry within the Israeli government um, and uh, like I think a lot of people have have you know noticed that like it's fucking insane that there are laws against bds in america right like it's it's almost jarringly strange that 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 there are um i know some southern states have adopted them as well i believe abby martin was at one point excluded from speaking at a university due to one of these laws either at the university or the state level i can't really remember um but that's like a big push by a lot of these groups too to like get these laws passed. And it's because they keep losing these battles like so mm-hmm. frequently where they will accuse somebody of anti-Semitism and they will, you know, try and get the accusations out there and a like they don't they don't fly or the somebody I mean, especially in the UK, you know, a panel will invest something will be somebody will be in panel to investigate and they'll find that actually no, it didn't happen. And that it was just criticism of the Israeli government. And so if like they keep losing these sorts of battles and if they keep losing like, you know, First Amendment battles, then they're going to say, all right, well, what's not protected speech? Hate speech. So then we redefine, you know, people saying that Israel shouldn't exist is hate speech. And therefore, you know, that, that like it's like you can sort of see why they're doing it and, and, and what they'll what they're trying to get out of it. Well, no, who are like the big players sort of on this scene? We mentioned the Canary Project, but like who else are we talking about here? So uh, one that sort of comes up in, in, in sort of a more kind of referenced off screen kind of way, but has some discussion in the documentary um, is APAC, the American yes. Israel uh, Public Affairs Committee. And APAC is like the largest, most influential and sort of the oldest. It was born like in the like middle of the 20th century, um, the Truman and Eisenhower years were pretty rocky for the US Israel relationship. And in that sort of period from like the 50s up until the Six Day War, you had a bunch of sort of like new Israel lobbies and advocacy groups emerge. And APAC in time became sort of the biggest, most well known one. And in the night by the 1990s, they were sort of considered like the most influential shop in Washington. And the way that they do that, the way that they do this is by, you know, sort of like like tapping a very, very, very highly engaged donor network. And mm-hmm. so they will bundle for politicians very aggressively based on the issue of Israel. And so, you know, while somebody has an individual, you know, contribution campaign limit of, you know, twenty seven hundred, three thousand bucks or whatever, um, if they're able to, you know, bundle that contribution from a whole bunch of different people, then they're going to be able to steer a lot of money into the hands of, uh, like, or into the, you know, bank accounts of preferred candidates. And they can do such, and they can do really large quantities that way because it's, you know, kind of a loophole and it doesn't necessarily show up in the, uh, like, you know, in, in filings saying like, oh yeah, this was all bundled together. Mm -hmm. Um, that's why this guy from like, you know, like, uh, 
like Skokie, Illinois is donating to a race in, you know, like, I don't know, like mm. central, the central Valley. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can you explain really quickly just what, how bundling works? Be- right. Just so it's, it's just kind of, it's kind of what I described there where it's like the system where you have like a, you know, like an, like an APAC activist or lobbyist or organizer, director, whatever, however they call them. Um, they will work with a bunch of, they'll, you know, find like a bunch of, uh, donors or prospective donors so let's say they'll have like a big dinner and they will have a you know like this is a hypothetical event like an israeli uh retired israeli colonel will come and give a talk about the situation along like the hezbollah border or something i found it fascinating (laughs) and and then you know they'll they'll do that and then they'll have you know like they'll bring out somebody and it's like, this is Karen, what's her face? And she's running for Congress here and she needs your support because the person she's running against like sucks on Israel or whatever. Um, and a lot of the time though, is the thing is, is like, that's how bundling works in action. And, and, and it's very effective. But the thing is, is that like APAC eventually got so powerful that it didn't need to do that anymore or it didn't have to do it very often because simply the threat of it was effective enough or simply giving people cash and saying, hey, listen, you're probably going to be the favorite in your race. And those are the races that they actually prefer. You're going to be the favorite in your race. Let's you know, like take this money. And then it's, yeah. you know, there's all these other kinds of support that they offer beyond just, you know, like actually giving money, but come in the form of these junkets and have to do a lot to do with, you know, sort of like being like a, a very, a very, uh, a very serious kind of resource to, you know, freshman congressmen or whatever. I mean, like APAC trips for many, many years have been a rite of passage. And, you know, well, like the Democratic Party hasn't like reached a particularly, uh, like, uh, let's say, uh, sufficiently mature position on the issue <laughs> of Israel-Palestine. Uh, you you do see the fact that like Rashida, uh, like, you know, Congressman Rashida Tlaib or, or Alhan Omar, the fact that they're like, you know, declining, like saying fuck off to APAC. Like that's a very novel development, and that is exactly what they've been afraid of for all these years. Like that's why they've been trying to erect these barriers so that they can try and keep people like that out. And APAC, I, I believe it's mentioned in the documentary, also flies out. I think it was APAC. They fly out journalists as well uh, uh, to to Israel too, and give them you know these helicopter tours, etc. And that, I mean, you can lobby congressman but you can also lobby the media to get the narrative that the congressman you know sort of goes with as well oh absolutely and i think that that sort of like media component is something that like is is kind of important to sort of like sit with for a second because a lot of what the media component ultimately is is about like you know creating the veneer of you know objective credibility and you know the, the the place where they do that the most is um with this group that's mentioned in the documentary a fair amount called the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies, FDD. Mm-hmm. Who are, by the way, we got to do an ad break. Uh, we are sponsored by the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Uh, you can hit them up. They make one of the, the softest pillows. They're also a pillow company that, 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 that advertises on podcasts as well. Make one of the softest pillows in the world. Have a great night's sleep on them. All right, back to the show. <laughs> Well, I, I mean, look, man, it's like I, I prefer raising money for for polio or for poor people or for frankly for women, um, <laughs> but that's just me. That's just me. <laughs> so, who is the Foundation for Defense of Democracies? Um, a well-known cabal of pedophiles. Uh, no, um, <laughs> correct, uh, correct. Uh, uh, no, the uh, uh, cut, cut, cut. Um, they're a like they're a think tank in D.C. That is like, I would situate like their sort of worldview somewhere between uh, Attila the Hun and <laughs> like uh, like Milosevic. I don't know. Like they're, okay. they're like they're very like they, they they've emerged in the last decade in like a fairly significant way as sort of like the policy shop for where creeps like Tom Cotton go to get yeah. like ideas stuffed in their head. They are they're like neo the, like extreme neocons, though. They're not like your New York Times neocons. And no, they're no, often, no. to be clear here, to be clear here, they're often Gentile neocons. They exist. <laughs> they are valid. <laughs> we hear you. We see we you. We see you. Yeah, this is like the Dr. Strangelove school of thought in D.C., yeah, I mean it's it's astounding. Like they are they are like that is like from the the swamp that Tom Cotton emerged from. 
And they are they are pretty big players in this as well. Like they go around giving uh, seminars, giving. I I gotta I gotta admit the amount of trainings that that the undercover man had to go through uh, during his time in DC seems excruciating. Just sitting in this like fluorescent lit office while some guy with like a tucked in or an untuck it shirt you know lectures you in front of a whiteboard with no writing on it. He's just talking. Um, it it just seems awful. I. I I got to say, respect to the fucking dude who had to go through all that. So it seems like, I mean, they're really getting at how the FDD was like directly coordinating with like the Israeli state. I mean, that's pretty much. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're in direct. That's that's illegal, by the way. (laughs) Yes. Yes. That's, that's like one of the things. So when we talked about earlier, when we mentioned at the beginning of the show that like this documentary shows some like really stunning like brazen illegal stuff like this is one of them that like the Republican Party's favorite foreign policy like think tank um, like the originator of like all of the heinous ideas you see the Trump administration trying to execute um, in Venezuela and so on like that is like that comes from FTD Uh, the FTD is actively like you know like working to lobby American officials with the assistance and support of like the Israeli government itself Mm mm-hmm and I mean, now, to be clear, this is the exact same thing that Democrats accuse Trump of doing with Russia. <laughs> I mean, I just want to like be clear so that people understand like what we're talking about. Like, you know, I do think it's important that no one seems to care. None of the Democrats seem to care or have a problem with revelations about, you know, the state of Israel doing, um, you know, not registering foreign agents, for example, or working directly, coordinating directly with American think tanks on behalf of the Israeli government. Um, I mean, the one of the like things that's like sort of like kind of especially crazy, I guess, with uh, FTD specifically is, you know, that like when we talk about like, you know, like these people are cranks and they have fringe views, but they're not fringe organizations because yeah. they're still part of the same network and ecosystem that all of the mainstream think tanks and orgs are. You know, for example, um, Center for American Progress and the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, at least according to some reporting I did last year, you know, they were co-sponsoring events together. Like they had a relationship, ideally the leading intellectual light of the Democratic Party and the FDD, like, you know, frankly, like a puppet of the Israeli government on these issues, like are, are, are staging stuff together for the edification of the wider world. It's fucked. Incredible. Yeah. Incredible. And it's all illegal. Yeah, <laughs> like I that's just, the thing. I'm like, I don't know. As, it's, yeah. As a freelance, uh, freelance FBI agent, I'm t- or just, you know, FBI helper. Uh, I, I gotta say, this 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 stuff was astounding to me. So I think we should we should we should mention here again that this documentary never came out. I mean, th- this is like, I, 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 let's let's be clear here about how much effort went into this. They sent a guy undercover for months and months and months and months, got incredibly incriminating footage on some of the scummiest people in Washington, and then uh, the documentary was basically uh, nixed. You can sort of trace, there's like a specific, there's like a single article that's kind of the beginning of like all of the re- like that sort of sets off the chain of events that will lead to the reasons for this documentary getting spiked. And it was published in a little uh, Jewish media concern called Tablet. Hold on, Young Chonsky, hit me with the noise. <laughs> yeah, this is a friend of the pod, right? Armin, Armin Rosen. Rosen. He's he's tweeted at us a couple times, I think. He right? has called this pot, even though. So to be clear, little background on the person who started this whole snowball of the of this this documentary getting canceled. He once paid one hundred and thirty seven dollars for a twenty five dollar ticket to get in to see the podcast Chapo Trap House featuring <laughs> True Anon podcast. At some, what the fuck, I can't remember the venue's name, even though I live in the city that it is in. Uh, so that is, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a huge percentages guy, 
But 25 is a lot less money than 137. And so I ask you, Armin, what kind of Jew are you, Armin? <laughs> what kind of Jew are you? Anyway, so yeah. Noah, tell me about this article. Well, so he publishes an article and the headline is pro-Israel hoaxer hits DC. And it basically describes and says every, it says that like there was apparently an Al Jazeera, like, so this article comes out by the way, on the day of Donald Trump's inauguration, but it basically says that, you know, it, 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 it doxes, uh, or rather it blows Tony's cover. And by this point, the, um, United Kingdom, uh, like lobby episode has aired and that aired in the UK and had like its own like massive ripple effect over there. Yeah. It was like um, mentioned they, in parliament. Boris Johnson got mad about it. Oh yeah. yeah. And the, well, because they, an Israeli official was seen trying to, was overheard, like, like was caught on camera saying, we got to get rid of the foreign minister of the UK who was a Tory, um, because he's not sufficiently pro Israel. Uh, which was uh, a really terrific cell phone. But so, so when that came out, they <laughs> used footage from Tony's time in DC and it quickly came out in tablet that like, oh shit, everybody in DC is like shitting their pants, at least in this, these pro-Israel circles, because this very charming guy came out and threw a lot of parties and talked to a lot of people. And it sort of like begins to set in motion this kind of uh, turmoil about, mm -hmm. well, what was it that this guy found out about the Israel lobby or what was the story that they were going to tell and who might that be bad news for? It's, it's interesting that this, this article came out on the day of Trump's inauguration because it, it really sort of sets in motion the Israel lobby itself's sort of plan for dealing with the revelations that, that are, fuck, revealed here. Um, I, I sorry, I didn't. I said revelations revealed. I my my bad. Let's just keep rolling, um, because uh, it, it just in, in line with how they react to it later. It, it's essentially they're trying to cause as few waves as possible to draw as little attention as possible to the even existence of this documentary, let alone what it shows. So we don't hear anything for several months, and uh, around this time, in about June of 2017, one of the worst things in my life happens. Um. I hate it when when the players club has a bit of a has a bit of a, a tiff. But uh, do you guys remember when Saudi Arabia and the UAE all out of out of seemingly if you're paying attention to the media out of nowhere blockaded the teeny state of Qatar? So to be clear, all these states are on the Arabian uh, Arabian Peninsula. Uh, Saudi Arabia is is the biggest one, and you know UAE is is not a, they're certainly not as big as Saudi Arabia. Qatar is the smallest one. Qatar has about 2 million people in it. I have no idea what the breakdown between basically servants and Qataris are there, but uh, it, there are definitely way more basically foreign laborers working sometimes in, under very bad conditions in Qatar than there are actual Qataris. Uh, uh, and, and it's a small country that kind of comes up like a little a vestigial tail off of the off of the uh, the east coast of the 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 peninsula, it is very small. At one point, Saudi Arabia actually planned to blockade it or to isolate it by building a canal across its border to literally <laughs> cut it to actually like straight up Bugs Bunny style cut it off of the entire peninsula. <laughs> Which is, I mean, a nefarious plan, but extremely funny. So we should say that right before uh, the blockade started, that a kind of a there was a big leak of emails to the Intercept uh, from the Emirati ambassador, and this is what's really funny is that uh, in the emails uh, he's discussing our old friends from the documentary, the FDD, and it uh, basically it sounds like they're kind of. I mean, I, I mean, what happens is that, you know, one of the demands in not blockading Qatar was that they, we need them to shut down Al Jazeera, and in particular, Al Jazeera operations aimed at, quote, defaming pro-Israel groups. So there seems to be a little funny timeline happening here. Well, it's, it's, it's really strange, too, because I think a lot of people just sort of have this blanket assumption that because, you know, Saudi Arabia, UAE, even Qatar, etc., 
all these states have Arab leaders, that they are naturally uh, basically 100% pro-Palestine, absolutely against <laughs> Israel. I mean, there was, I mean, to be clear, there was a time when you could, if you were Jewish, you were not allowed to go to Saudi Arabia, even if you weren't Israeli. Uh, I think it's still technically a law in the books that if you have an Israeli stamp in your passport that you can't get into Saudi Arabia. But that is not the case anymore. And and it seems like basically all of the Gulf states have essentially been jockeying for for to see who is who basically most favored uh, when it comes to relations with Israel. Right. And in this case, you know, Part of what was so sort of, I mean, just to give an example, a couple of years ago when I went to the uh, APAC policy conference, like their big annual gala in D.C., they uh, like, you know, the the uh, the leader of a very influential uh, American Jewish organization I saw got up and you know among the first things out of his mouth was him talking about how in a room full of thousands of people about how he had just taken this trip to this incredible enlightened nation of of, of the United Arab Emirates and that the mm-hmm. Emiratis were sort of modeling a kind of, you know, Arab uh, government that we could work with. And it's because, like, you know, underneath the hood, while Israel doesn't have formal diplomatic relations with any of these countries, Israel is working hand in glove with Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates on a wide variety of, you know, issues, largely, like, most importantly, trying to figure out how to, like, contain Iran, who is, like, their, like, chief regional rival. And Qatar has, like, you know, got caught kind of in the crossfire of that. Yeah, the Qataris and the, the, the Saudis do not get along for a variety of reasons, some of which I understand, some of which I do not understand. I mean, both of them are essentially similar in many respects. They are both hereditary monarchies, although Saudi Arabia, I got to say, the line of succession there got a little wonky in recent <laughs> years. I'm not really sure exactly how that's playing out, but hey, what do I look like? One of those guys who draws the fucking coats of arms in England for the rich people? I don't know. I'm not that guy. Uh, but they both sell a ton of oil to the West. The problem is, though, is Qatar, I think, is doing almost better in some respects with, with how much they're basically rationing their oil or selling their oil. Again, not an oil man. I don't know. But um, there were rumblings that maybe one of the reasons that Saudi Arabia was essentially trying to gin up problems with uh, Qatar is so that they might have a pretext for invasion, which could lead to them essentially seizing, of course, all their oil supplies. I'm sure they would install some puppet monarchy or whatever, uh, and their entire, like, many hundreds of billion dollars worth uh, sovereign wealth fund. And Qatar, like, you know, because of, like, this huge schism with the Saudi Arabia, they sort of started engaging in their own campaign and this is all in the months after this documentary is is done being like you know it's it's like they they've done the reporting work or they're either in the process of making it or they have made it and it just hasn't come out yet but as that's unfolding the government of qatar is sort of trying to figure out like okay uh, how do we either end this blockade like what is it that we can do to improve our position in the with at least with the united states who which is of course the only like country that has the power to like you know jerk the strings of saudi arabia and the united arab emirates qatar's like you know new enemies so qatar did the same thing that i do whenever some insane person with a dog avatar says that i'm anti-semitic on twitter they invite the worst most insane right-wing Jews over to their kingdom to have a uh, a series of chats. And now, the people they invite is a who's who's of alleged blank blanks. We've got Malcolm H- Henla. I don't know how to pronounce this fucking guy's name. Honla. No, you go through these assholes. You know all these motherfuckers. Well, so like Qatar had invited like Dershowitz, Malcolm Honline, who's the who who's like the like a major domo in the American Jewish community. Um, I mean, Jack Rosen from the American Jewish Congress. I mean, really, more Klein, Dershowitz, and Honlin are, like, the big names here. And those are, like, you know, that's part of the charm offensive that they had brought. Like, you know, whereas the UAE and Saudi had paid for their own, like, you know, junkets of different American Jewish leaders. But, like, they're, like, like these, like, the elements of the pro-Israel lobby are working, you know... They're working overtime, I guess, uh, to to try and figure out, or, or rather, 
they're working overtime as you know agents for the israeli government's interests sort of figuring out like between qatar and saudi arabia and the uae like you know where the best hand for them lies like who can get, be the greatest assets for them at the same time they hire this guy nick muzzin uh who was like a former aide to ted cruz sort of like midwig not necessarily big wig washington lobbyist who when i was researching this guy i found a series of basically incomprehensible articles because i was very tired and had trouble comprehending anything in the first place about various schemes and scams this little scumbag had inserted himself to but let me tell you his one of his biggest jobs before getting hired by qatar was that he was working as a registered foreign agent for the Albanian Democratic Party, who it might shock you to find out are, well, they are Albanian, but they are not very democratic and have a <laughs> series of, 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 I hate to bring up the guy's name again, but Bugs Bunny like uh, scandals <laughs> and, and schemes that they've gotten themselves into on the, on the, well, Albania actually, to be, to be completely honest with you, is kind of like the Qatar of the, of the Balkans. It's a little <laughs> strip of land, much smaller than the other ones. That that is is it's different. Um, but they hire this guy, and this guy is going around telling everybody, "Don't worry, don't worry. I I I'll make sure that this documentary doesn't rear its ugly head." And it's like you know, I mean, it 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 even went up past the pay grade of this guy, uh, at least according to some other reports. Um, like it started. I mean, the documentary as like a, a like. I guess it went all the way to the top, so to speak. No, it, according to a report, and I think 972, at a report that I believe Rex Tillerson actually brought this up to the Emir of Qatar and was like, do not let this documentary come out. So yeah, Rex Tillerson, the former Secretary of State, to be correct. clear. Correct. And uh, the uh, former, uh, former CEO, CEO of ExxonMobil. Exactly. Who uh, you might surprise our listeners, but ExxonMobil has a bit of a uh, Qatar connection, considering that they have a uh, a a tendril uh, company in that co- in that country. Um, I was astounded to find out. Uh, Intercept the Intercept did some really good reporting on this whole saga. Uh, much of what we've talked about um, so far, but uh, that that. Tillerson's sort of dealings with Qatar during the blockade crisis might be the actual reason that Tillerson was booted out. Because while Tillerson was in Qatar trying to sort of, you know, smooth ruffled feathers and trying to trying to lift the blockade and get this crisis sort of resolved, Trump was like, I think this surprised a lot of people how ha- Trump was going fucking ham on Qatar for like a month. Like he was talking about Qatar in speeches he was calling them like one of the lead sponsors of terrorism. I, I, I mean, it, it was pretty astounding because one doesn't get the impression that Trump is is entirely familiar with the workings of of that small small peninsular nation. I mean, it's I think one of the pretty wild things, at least to me, that sort of like stuck out from like the response to the lobby as well was sort of how quickly people began targeting Al Jazeera specifically. Yep. And mm-hmm. one of the things that they said about Al Jazeera is that it was a hate network, a terror factory and so on, which felt like, you know, like Ted Cruz and a bunch of other people like signed some stupid letter. But it, I guess what's kind of wild to me is that that's actually the exact thing that's described in the like lobby documentary, which is that these as these mm-hmm. activists proudly say themselves, which is that, you know, the way that like you defeat your opponent isn't by like addressing any of the facts of the case. It's by saying that they hate Jews and that they're terrorists. And that's immediately what like, you know, they started getting U S senators to say about Al Jazeera in order to like, you know, like nip this in the bud and uh, try, they were pushing to get Al Jazeera to be forced to register as like a, as like a, like like a foreign, like a a foreign agent representing the government of Qatar. Yeah. I, I thought that was astounding because they basically flipped the script on Al Jazeera. And, and of course, if Al Jazeera, like correspondents or producers, whatever, did have to register as foreign agents in America, they would of course be blocked from a lot of the things that they would normally have access to being, being agents of the press. Um, it's, it's, it's astounding. And, and at one point, Electronic Intifada reports that America threatened to uh, remove their airbase from Qatar. Basically, over over this movie, 
that say like if you let this movie come out we will take our troops out of the air base and and sort of the subtext there is that if if we take our troops out Saudi Arabian that- military will will roll on through and to be completely honest with you if you look up on live leaks footage of Saudi Arabian armored uh columns and 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 motorized troops in Yemen I have no no doubt that about 500 well-trained commandos could take out the entire Saudi Arabian army. However, if Qatar wants to talk to me about that on a financial level, you know. Well, the irony is that it actually would be our troops coming in from the Saudi, in the Saudi forces. <laughs> yeah. Well, at least Just, Blackwater. Yes, correct. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think too, like, it's not just that, I mean, so they, you know, it's like smearing everyone as terrorists, but they also like, you know, they they did acknowledge that the document that the documentary had been leaked, and they basically said they're like, "Don't watch it. You're not going to learn anything. It's boring. There's nothing in here." And like the response from the media was total compliance. Like there was been in the UK at least, you know, <laughs> it really was covered in a lot of the papers and on the BBC, and like we mentioned before in Parliament, but like. No one in America was reporting on anything that was in this documentary. And there's no, quite a why lot. do you think why do you think that is, Noah? You know a lot more about this stuff than <laughs> I do. I would yeah, say Yeah, you got that, that blue check inside inside track. Well, when I put my fingers to my temples and like become one with my blue check, what it tells me <laughs> is that the American media like has a really, really substantial blind spot when it comes to Palestine. A lot mm-hmm. of it is rooted in, I think, just like pretty basic, like anti-Muslim, anti-Arab bigotry. And mm-hmm. like that's a sort of like kind of base explanation that you can give for a lot of why, like, you know, like footage of, you know, it, it explains why MSNBC will show footage from the aftermath, ma- aftermath of a stabbing attack in Tel Aviv, but will not show the footage of, you know, like a far more routine occurrence, which is an IDF soldier shooting a Palestinian dead. And I think that, like, that explains some of it. And then the other part of it, though, is that, and I think that this is perhaps, like, a more, and, and, you know, and then another explanation is that, you know, there are probably some journalists who bought the Israel lobby's line and said, like, yeah. like they were, like, you know, when they asked questions about it, they were like, listen, don't worry about it. And they took their word for it. But what I think is probably the most likely and the biggest explanation for this particular story, um, or at least one that has an outsized impact, is that so much of what is revealed in this documentary is like fairly oxygenated to media and Washington types. A lot of them would look at a lot of the conversations in this and they would look at a lot of the kinds of people that are talking and they would see the things that they say and they would say, that's really interesting. I kind of already knew that though. And they don't take that as an Mm -hmm. indictment of the system in which they work. They take that as evidence of how banal the facts are in this movie. And that couldn't be further from the truth. Because the thing is, is that there is no recorded testimony of these kinds of things, even if it's such a, you know, widely uh, felt sentiment. There isn't the kind of frankness, even if like, you know, this reporter or somebody imagines there to be. I think that there is something like, you know, really important to be said for the fact that like this documentary does a lot to just put people in front of a camera in an environment in which they never get to speak before cameras. And yes. so a kind of conversation that only ever really happens behind closed doors or at least in some very private rooms, it comes out into the open. And you know, because a lot of the people who report on these spaces, and that's not to say that like they're evil reporters or sinister people, but just because like they're so embedded in these systems that they may not recognize it. And I think that that's like a really sad kind of tragic thing that like a lot of media class types have to live with, especially when it comes to Israel Palestine, is that the horror and the misdeeds and like the epic failure and incompetence and the scheming, all of it, it resides in plain view. They just don't do anything about it. So, uh, if there's anything I've learned from this is that, um, I got to become a lobbyist guys. This looks totally lucrative. You see those offices these guys have? 
I too, you too can work in a place with entirely IKEA furniture in a place with a fifty thousand dollar per foot lease in on K Street. I think this shit drives me so fucking like crazy because like you know I am a Jew. There are there are three Jews on this little Google chat or whatever right here, and it's like there is like this sort of pro Israel like narrative and 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 really lifestyle basically is so prominent and so much at the forefront of like what it what it what it's what it's like publicly meant to be Jewish in America that like it's it essentially like estranges anybody who's not from that or divorces anybody who's not about that um from being like Jewish in a way. Yeah. I don't know. It's it's it just obviously people have said that much much more eloquently than I have. But like I got to be honest with you, watching this stuff like really breaks my heart. Like, it's, well, it's it like horrible. It, it really illustrates. It almost feels like, you know, like, like imagine taking like an entire like culture or an entire like heritage or whatever. I mean, like to say nothing of like, you know, like, like, like Holocaust legacy and so on, but yeah. to essentialize it in this way where it just becomes entirely about one's relationship to the Israeli government. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it's like, it's revolting, man. And like, I like, you know, like my own personal like history wrapped up in this kind of stuff aside and being active on this issue, it feels like a lot of what these people are doing is helping to sort of foreclose the possibility in a lot of people's eyes that really there's any sort of like value in like engaging with like, you know, like Jewish communities or whatever, because mm-hmm. this is like the heinous shit they're up to. I mean, at least, at least the org, at least the organized parts of them. And yeah. like, I think a lot of people like, I- a lot of people do know this, but like it bears repeating is that this, these appeals to evangelicals are, are so sort of terrifying. If you really know what, what's behind the evangelical support for Israel, which is that they do believe that Jews should leave the West and move to Israel and establish greater Israel, um, presumably over the dead bodies of the people who live in what would become greater Israel. Uh, so that the, the apocalypse could come, should come. Yes, and so what they, they believe wanted, in the eradication of the diaspora. <laughs> exactly. I mean, that's the logic. It's and horrifying. so, like, by making an alliance with people who who very blatantly and 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 publicly believe that um, these Zionist organizations are essentially like, I don't know, it, repeating history in just this new, perverse, horrible way. That I, that it, I don't know, it drives me crazy. I mean, I also think that like you know the Christian stuff is important to look at, but it's like it, like the forest shouldn't get lost for the trees there, just because yeah. it is like like you know being a pro is be like pro Israel activism is not like some boutique special little interest. It's part of a constellation of right wing interests that are present in you know all of like you know like the major political institutions in American life. It's like a very like it's a it's a pervasive attitude supported by a like very wide network of institutions, a lot of which have support from the Israeli government, a lot of which don't need it. And a lot of yeah. which, you know, see within the Jews and the pro Israel movement, you know, they're an instrument for quite literally their own salvation. <laughs> yes. Um, I, so it's I, I think like, you know, you when you signed up to be in the pro Israel movement, uh, you get a lot of like strange bedfellows, including people who hope for, for your eventual eventual death. Yeah, it's uh. Well, on that note, thank you so much for joining us, Noah. Noah, tell me about tell me about your podcast once more. Right. You were so, so fantastic on ours; it would be a shame not to tell them about yours. Uh, sure, thank you. Well, so on Monday, uh, my podcast with my co-host Brendan James, who also produced the show, uh, this podcast Blowback, it will be coming out um, pretty much anywhere you get your podcasts. If you look up the podcast Blowback on your Apple Podcasts app. Uh, your Stitcher app, your Overcast app, wherever you get podcasts, just uh, and you see the picture of Saddam Hussein, that's us. On Monday morning, you will have the first episode in your feed. Uh, it's called Rosebud. It's terrific. And uh, there's already, if you want to listen, there is actually an episode you can listen to now. It's a pilot episode that sort of sets up a little bit of what Brendan and I wanted to, you know, get done with the show. And I think it's a pretty good introduction. It features the vocal stylings of H. John Benjamin. And James Adomian, it's a it's a it's a fucking ride. It's great. It's and great. Subscribe to Blowback. Uh, you guys will love it. Well, yeah, I'll tell you, true and on seal of approval right there. Uh, guys, I think we can. I don't even know. I don't even know if we have to do the break and then the other outro. I think we just do the outro here, the regular one. You guys Let's do it live. Game? 
<laughs> Let's do it live, baby. I can, I'll write it and we'll do it live. Okay. My name is Brace, a.k.a. So Damn Insane. What? I'm joined. <laughs> I'm joined. I'm joined. I'm joined like by. Seconds. I'm joined by. Oh, I'm Liz. Thank God. Uh, featuring the <laughs> musical stylings and production of Young Chomsky, a.k.a. Uday Hussein. Uh, <laughs> and that's true and on, baby. Thanks, Noah. Thank you. This is a lot of fun. We will see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.